Yo, my brethren, I am back for the second segment of the Argento Thon. That's right. Let's dive right back in. We were just talking about Deep Red. Deep Red being kind of the, uh, the breakout favorite that kind of got his name out there. Basically, kind of made everybody want to go back and uh, watch his earlier works from the prior three that I just talked about. But then there was one that came along right after that that kind of mixed Jalo with supernatural elements and basically set, set the world on fire for him and made him an international favorite at that time. I am, of course, referring to Suspiria. Suspiria, the version I have is on Blue Underground 2 Disc Special Edition. I'm thinking, I read somewhere, that this one has just went out of print, but I hear tell they're going to re-release it on Blu-ray soon. I don't know when. But that might just be a rumor. I'm not sure. But Suspiria being a bit different, it just uh, it is a giallo, but it's also a supernatural story. It's basically about a uh, coven of witches that are in Germany and run a dancing school, at which a uh, a young American girl goes there to study, and she stumbles upon their secrets of the uh, the witch's coven, basically. And it's about her kind of pseudo-investigating what's going on around her, and some murders take place, some really wild visuals in this movie. What it's most notably uh, known for is its highly, highly stylistic use of color in this movie, of a lot of the primary colors of, you know, red, green, blues, and stuff like that. Highly color inducement in this movie. Um, gotta say, as far as style goes, this is his most stylistic film. It's probably not my favorite, it's just my not my personal favorite Dario Argento film, but i got to say it's in my top three, just like, just like about everybody else, or top five uh, Argento films. From 1977, if you go with the Blue Underground, I don't think you'll be uh, sorry. It looks great, it sounds great, it's cleaned up, uh, it's got a music score by the Goblin Group again. Um, it's a little light on special features for what you would think would be in a two-disc special edition, but I was happy with it. A lot of these, uh, you, you know, you've got some uh, good interviews on there, theatrical trailers, that type of thing. Suspiria, basically, like I was saying before, takes place around this girl. She's trying to find out who's killing people at the school and what's going on. It's, uh, like I said, it's kind of one of those, I wouldn't recommend drinking a whole lot of caffeine whenever you see this movie. Uh, if you're going to watch it, do it right. Get you a widescreen TV, uh, turn on your surround sound, turn the sound up a little bit, turn out the lights, and watch it right with a group of people that have never seen it before. You'll get your most enjoyment out of it that way because the first act of the film, at least I was anyway, you're going to be sitting there going, what in the world is it that I'm watching? I don't understand this. Then when it gets in about the second act, you understand, oh, this is about witchcraft or some witches or something. But it's not your typical witch movie. I mean, you get into it and you're kind of like, man, this is a lot different than what I'm used to. You know, I'm used to these green-faced, long-nosed, you know, pointy hat-wearing women riding brooms and stuff. And this is witches, but witches in the Argento vi the vein, you know, basically. So um, I highly recommend the Blue Underground one, mainly because it's digitally remastered under the THX sound. And it's just a really good transfer of the movie. Um, I've been really happy with it. Um, I was lucky to get it because I think it went out of uh, print and then I saw one at a Borders Books uh, when they were closing up and I picked it up for a discount. So it's got an English 5 to 1, uh, or excuse me, 6 to 1 DTS uh, audio and 5 to 1 Dolby Digital surround sound mix as well as 2.0 stereo. Suspiria, definitely an experience to be had. It's one of those required reading ones. I highly recommend picking it up. If you want to get if you want to get the basics about what Dario Argento is about, watch this one, watch Deep Red, and maybe some of the other ones as I notice go along. And I don't think you'll be sorry. Um, moving on, his next uh, effort after Suspiria's kind of breakout uh, international hit uh, was the movie called Inferno. Um, Inferno is kind of what I like to explain is a loosely based sequel or major companion piece to Suspiria because what you find out in the exposition of Inferno is that there's a framework now about a three-part storyline of the three mothers and what the three mothers are, are these three ultimate witches that are spread across the globe from New York to Rome Italy to uh, Germany and Germany being the one that took place in Suspiria the storyline there 
Inferno takes place in, uh, around the, the witch that is uh, hiding in New York. And it basically takes place around a young girl who's killed and her brother comes home from studies in Rome to find out what happened to her. Now, I'm not going to say it's as good as Suspiria, but it's every bit as colorful and atmospheric as Suspiria. Um, instead, this one, they go with a lot more blue and purple tones to the, to the color scheme, and it's really high color inducement in this one as well. It's got some chills. It's got suspense. It's more of a, got more of the giallo inducement in this film, but the storyline in this one is a bit uneven. I've always thought that about Inferno, and anybody that's seen it or is an Argento nerd, they're going to tell you the same thing, that uh, good luck on trying to figure out what the plot of this movie is or following it. You really have to watch it, but then by about the third act, they don't really explain a whole lot, and it just gets into to a visual feast of uh, the, the building burning down, hence the, you know, the title Inferno. Uh, the building burning down around the main character and uh, all the, the rockin' score that's in this movie. I don't believe Goblin did the score from this one. Uh, the music was uh, per arranged by Emerson from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer uh, fame. He did a great kind of operatic kind of, I don't know how you would, uh, how you would kind of uh, describe the music score from this movie. But it's along the same lines of Suspiria. Not quite as wild, or it can't even touch this, the soundtrack from Suspiria that Goblin put out. That was the most wild soundtrack I think I've ever heard. Just all kinds of weird noises and howls and stuff. Inferno's got its share of them, but it's a good follow-up to Suspiria, but not as w widely known. I think there was some studio trouble with Inferno, because I think 20th Century Fox was the studio that was going to distribute it in America at the time. And they had some uh, creative differences with Dario and stuff like that. Dario, I have to give him props. He's always been really adamant about what type of story he wants to tell. And uh, basically, you know, what kind of uh, visuals he wants to show. He knows what he wants to do. As long as you leave him alone, you'll get a good product. And that's what I've always thought about Argento's films. Um, but anyway, Inferno, I say see it. It's not as good as Suspiria, but it's one of those that's just about as good. And he definitely, it's one of his better films. Kind of one of the most underrated films that he's had over the years. Ah. Next films I'm going to talk about are in my little box set, the little uh, collectible tin that I've got, the Dario Argento collection from Anchor Bay Collection. It houses two Knock Your Socks Off uh, films. It's got one okay film and two newer films that we'll talk about later. Uh, the first of which I'm going to talk about is Tenebrae. Tenebrae is basically a straight-up return to Giallo in every sense of the word. You've got uh, Claudio Simonetti doing the, uh, from Goblin fame doing the soundtrack in this one. It's like a return to form. It's a, it's a really great Giallo film. It's probably my top three of Argento's films in terms of rewatchability because Tenebrae will not I don't think it will disappoint in any way. It's just a really fulfilling return to just straight up slasher. It's more of a slasher than any of the other Jalos that he's done, and it takes place around a uh, an author that goes on a uh, promotional tour. While he's on a promotional tour, someone is killing people like the events of his book that's got the same title, Tenebrae, and basically there's some plot twists in there that are pretty good. The special effects are great. Great practical effects in this in, in this film. Uh, uh, great blood effects, things like that. Um, there's a scene where a girl gets her arm cut off. The blood flow from that scene looks very. It's very over the top, but it's also very realistic at the same time. And I, I'm not gonna spoil it. You're not gonna know when it's gonna happen, but uh, watch for that scene. It's a highlight in the film. There's a lot of axe uh, hits in the movie that are pretty good. Um, I don't know. I just enjoyed this one overall. I love the soundtrack of Tenebrae too. It's kind of like a, a a dirty disco funk horror movie score or something. It's really strange how to how to explain it. Um, if you go on YouTube, you can check out soundtracks from these movies if you're ever interested in just hearing the music. Tenebrae won't disappoint. If you're a straight up Jalo fan, it's it's Jalo times ten. I really enjoyed that one. Um, the next film and the ones I'm going to talk about today is Phenomena. It, Phenomena is kind of a collective film. It's where he took like a lot of tools from the last few that he just did and basically uh, culminated them into 
it's it's basically a, a kind of a return to the Suspiria notion of it's Jalo plus something else. This one has to do with Jalo plus psychic abilities. Psychic abilities in the form of a young actress by the name of Jennifer Connelly. She's in this film. She plays a young girl who's studying in Switzerland, I believe it is. It starts out like a straight-up Jalo film, a girl getting killed. And after that, you find out there's a killer on the loose, but there's the side story subplot that gets developed with her and Donald Pleasance, who's a he's a scientist who studies the uh, decomposition of dead bodies for the police uh, from insects and things of that nature. It just so happens that Jennifer Connelly's character, she has the psychic ability to have telepathy between her and insects in the film, which comes into play later in helping her and things of that nature. Um, there's plot twists abound in this one. The music score is kind of all over the place in this one. This is one of those kind of like Demons, uh, I think it's a Baba film of the mid-80s, where they a lot of these Italian directors were uh, experimenting with having rock groups and punk rock groups and hair, hair bands of the day uh, giving a song or two per, per band for their soundtrack of the movie. Now, it has some good uh, instrumental soundtracks during the her dream sequences and things like that which are very, those are highly visual visual feasts in the movie. And it's got some good, uh, like I was saying, some good instrumental and some good uh, uh, operatic sounds to that. And it's also got some uh, kind of rock-based uh, stuff in there too. But uh, the biggest thing about Phenomena is it's a good story. It's got a lot of, lot to offer in it. It tries to do a little bit too much for one movie, but it's, it's a decent ride to take. And i got to be honest, guys, um, the only major problem with Phenomena is up until just a couple years ago, you couldn't see it in the U.S. in its entirety the way it was meant to be seen. Up until then, we were subjected with these highly censored, highly hacked up, uh, retitled uh, versions of this film. The retitle in America was Creepers. That's the only one I knew it by. I didn't even know it was the same film to, up until a few years ago. But uh, basically, if you want my opinion, don't get any other version other than the the Anchor Bay version. Watch that. You'll get the full uncensored version. It's anamorphic widescreen. You can see the, I mean, it's like a 2, 3, 5 to 1 ratio. When you try to watch that on a pan and scan or a hacked up VHS version, you're missing half the film in that movie. When I meant, remember what I was saying along the way, it's style over substance. And you're watching these movies mainly for the visual feast of it. So, Phenomena, definitely get a good copy of that movie and you'll really have a great time with it. It's probably not to everybody's taste. It's one of those uh, Camps Divided titles in Argento's collection, as I've uh, noticed from a lot of people's input over the years. But it won't disappoint, I don't think. Let me get a little drink of water here, guys. Next up in the Argento-thon, I'm going to talk about a newer one, I think from the early to mid-90s, called Trauma. Uh, Trauma... Uh, stars Aja Argento, which is uh, Dario Argento's youngest daughter. She, it's basically, and I think it's got Popper Laurie in it as well as a minor role and some other American actors you've seen over the years. It's an okay film. It's not uh, going to be in the same kind of grading category as a lot of the greatest hits ones we just talked about, but it's probably worth your time to at least rent or check out. It's got, I believe, some... Uh, uh, special effects from Tom Savini, but the only problem is it is one of the cons of the movie is you don't really get to see a lot uh, enough of the Savini effects. They're very seamless and very minimal in the movie, so I wouldn't go into it thinking it's going to be like Friday Four or something like that, or Dawn of the Dead or Day of the Dead, something like that, a big Savini show. But it does have some decent little kill scenes in it for a Jalo film. Um, it's got a weird atmosphere to it. Um, you know, it's just kind of worth it. I would say worth at least a Netflix or a rental. Try it on for size. See if you like it. Uh, the next one in this one, I'm not going to talk about this one a whole lot because it was just okay. The card player. Um, I had an okay time with the card player. Um, it's something, it's kind of done. It was a later entry, the late 90s or the early 2000s. The card player is basically kind of a, I don't want to call it an Italian takeoff on Saw films or anything like that, but it's, it's one of those that kind of shows where horror films were at that time in terms of movies like Hostel and Saw and stuff like that. It's kind of the Argento version or the Argento entry of that. Um, it has to do with the killer basically uh, kidnapping victims and 
putting them on an online uh, jackpot or an online gambling site where if you gamble and you win, it keeps them alive longer. And if you gamble and you lose, he starts killing them slowly, basically. Um, it's kind of like a whodunit movie at that point. I would say trauma's a little better, but uh, give the card player a viewing. See if you like it. It might be to your, to your uh, liking. It's not going to be... The problem with card player is I don't think it has a whole lot of rewatchability because it's just not something I like to watch a whole lot of, like torture films, stuff like that. I can watch a slasher all day long, but a torture film... I, I don't know why. Just in terms of rewatchability, I can watch Martyrs and you know, movies like that and Hostel and stuff, but the thing is, it's just not something I'm going to go to and rewatch for style content or something to enjoy. Um, the last one in the little five films of Argento pack I have is uh, Do You Like Hitchcock? I'm just going to keep that one simple, guys. To its defense, it's a TV movie that Dario did. Um, take it or leave it, guys. You know, it's up to you guys if you really want to watch that one. I really didn't have a good time watching Do, Do You Like Hitchcock. He, like, tries to pay homage, I believe, because there was a lot of influence over his years of uh, experience that he was always dubbed to, to be the Italian Hitchcock. And I got to say that, uh, I don't know, I kind of take it or leave it on Do You Like Hitchcock. I'm not going to go into great detail on that one because... That one's definitely going to be to your taste only. If you want to watch it, I say rent it or Netflix it definitely before you go out and buy it or something. I don't believe it even has a surround sound mix on the film. It's only in stereo. To kind of round it out here on the Argento-thon, let's talk about a highly underrated 80s Argento film that I just got recently and was finally able to see in an uncensored format. The movie is Dario Argento's Opera. Now, you owe it to yourself to go and, I say go ahead and pick this one up. If you like Tenebrae, if you like Deep Red, if you like any of those type of Jalo films, Bird with Crystal Plumage, you are more likely going to like opera. Now, the musical score in the movie is definitely going to have a lot of operatic inducement and stuff like that in it. Expect that. But what, the, what evens it out is the parts with the killer in the movie, wearing gloves again, mind you, it basically has a rock score for him, so it kind of evens the opera out a little bit to me. Good kill scenes in the movie, straight up slasher. Um, a little bit faster pace in this one. It's not quite two hours. I think it's an hour and 40-some minutes, so it's got uh, a, a great behind-the-scenes interview uh, with uh, Argento and the makers of the film, the uh, music composers. Um, the, this is the Anchor Bay uh, THX Certified Edition. I highly recommend picking up opera. I was really surprised. I had a really great time watching it for the first time. It makes a difference. Let me say it that way. It makes a difference to see this film in an uncensored format. I wouldn't even bother Netflix in this one, guys, because I think it's a hacked up copy. I could be wrong, but every time I've tried twice to Netflix it, and it just it was always a shortened version or a, a pan and scan full screen version or something like that. So. That's it's basically about a killer uh, trying to stalk an understudy of an opera singer. An opera singer has an accident. Her understudy takes over the Macbeth production that they're doing. And it's about a stalking killer that's uh, stalking the understudy uh, lady that's taking over her role. Um, it's got everything a good Jalo would want in its diet. So I say watch it, pick it up. I don't want to spoil too much of it, but it's a really great entry for Argento. Probably the last true-to-form Jalo greatest hits for him. Um, now, he's made some good ones since. I've heard a lot of good things about uh, a, a 2000s Jalo by the uh, title of Sleepless. Now, I've yet to see Sleepless. And I've also, also heard a lot of people say that the third part of the Three Mothers trilogy, which came out much later, called Mother of Tears, is pretty good. Now, I've yet to see those. Those will be in an update for another day. But what I want to do today to cap off my little Argento-thon mini-reviews is to kind of cap it off with Jalo, aptly titled there. Got this uh, bad boy for about $2. It was a $2 special at a local mom and pop uh, video store that closed up recently. This is the the re uh, supposed uh, return to form for Dario Argento that's already got that reputation of having a black cloud over its production, in part by creative differences between Dario and the producers, or producer, and Adrian Brody suing the uh, 
suing the distributors then asking them not to distribute the movie because he doesn't like the movie or doesn't like his performance in it. I gotta say, guys, um, the thing I thought hurt Jalo the most, it's not a bad trip to take at least once. I'm gonna go ahead and say that. It's not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I mean, it's not his best film by far. But the thing is, a lot of people went into this thinking it was going to be Jalo like Opera or like Tenebrae or Deep Red or anything like that, meaning the secondary meaning of the word. No. The meaning of this title for this film, it's a big misconception. The killer in the film has a nickname, Jalo, meaning yellow in Italian. Because the killer in the film, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little spoiler, has yellow jaundice, which you know if you have that disease, it turns the tint of your skin and the areas where your veins and you know the tint of your skin becomes a yellow a light yellow color or a faint yellow color so that really it's more of a faster paced cop versus crook psychological thriller is what Jalo is so don't expect it to be high style over substance or anything like that music in the film is okay the acting is okay I actually kinda liked Adrian Brody in this role because he doesn't say much it's kind of a underplayed role for him I don't really know what he has to gripe about too much. I don't particularly like him as an actor because I don't really like the way he acts in most movies. But in this one, he actually did an okay job, to my surprise. And I thought the acting was okay in the movie. Um, there's not too much of a plot twist in the movie or anything like that. Um, the special effects in this movie, the practical effects, were pretty good. I didn't notice too many CGI moments in the film. This is an unrated copy of the film if you can find it at your local Blockbuster or on Netflix. Um, you definitely want to get the unrated version. Um, there's a few practical effect moments in the film that were kind of, ooh, ooh, kind of, you know, like old Savini moments. So I got to say the special effects in this movie were top notch when they did happen. Um, like I said, it's faster paced. It's a 92 minute movie versus some of his old two hour Jalo uh, films from yesteryear. Um, Adrian Brody didn't bother me too much in this movie. It's just not going to be the one that I go to first because I just I grew up during the 80s watching a lot of these films and revisiting them now. It kind of, it's kind of the vibe that I like to watch. But now Jalo, I would probably grab it before I grab the card player or uh, even Trauma or some of these other ones that have come out in you know post opera time frame. So I say at least rent this one and draw your own conclusion. I'm going to go ahead and say Jalo is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's not as great as some of his other films. But for two bucks, it wasn't bad putting it in the collection. So, I don't know. It's a decent thriller. It's uh, got some decent little little shock moments in it. So, I say give it a viewing, guys. That has been the Argentothon. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I'm going to take a break.